Welcome to Astrology Night, the first Wednesday night of every month, live at Soul Food Coffee House in Redmond, Washington. I'm Jeff Jower, and this is... I'm Rick Levine. And we're just... an identity swap, apparently. Yeah, we're doing some role <laughs> reversal here. And we are here to talk about the astrology of the month ahead. And this month, July of 2014, is an interesting month because... It is the first month of the second half of the year, but rarely or maybe never have I seen a year where from July onward is such a different year than from January through June. It's almost like 2014 is two different years, and we will dig into this a little bit as we talk about how this month unfolds. Yeah, and in some ways, the first part, the first half of 2014, has been like the exhibition season. There have been so many planets retrograde. Venus has been retrograde. Mercury has been retrograde twice. twice. Mars has been retrograde. And Mars, the action planet, is still in Libra, but it's finally changing signs this month. So this is uh, an opportunity, I think, for a fresh start. Yeah, it really, it really is a, a new beginning in many ways, which is odd for this time of year, even though the sun is in Cancer this month, or most of this month, and Cancer is a cardinal or season starting sign, meaning it's the beginning of the season, Cancer in some ways really likes to hold on to what it's got or what it had rather than pushing into new territory. And so it's odd that we get this kind of uh, symbolic juxtaposition of being pushed into a new year while the sun is really wanting to hold on to the past. Yeah, that is a paradox of the sign Cancer. All the seasons starting signs, Aries, Cancer, Libra, and Capricorn are called cardinal and they have to do with getting things going. But Rick, you're absolutely right. Cancer, a water sign, a feeling sign, a sign symbolized by the crab is very inward turning. So perhaps the idea of starting things in the sign of cancer is really about watering the garden. It really has to do perhaps with an internal process of self-seeding or of watering or of fertilizing to get us going on the inside with less of a hurry or push to make an observable external uh, impact. How many people here are either Cancer Sun signs, Cancer Moon signs, keep the hands up, Cancer Ascendant, or something? A bunch of you. You see, I, I think Jeff really hit on something, or between... I think that Jeff really hit on something with respect to Cancer, and it really is a bit of a paradox but I often go back to the animal totems to get the best understanding of each sign. And cancer, which is just Latin for crab, you know, the crab lives in the seashore in the, in the intertidal zone. This is the area where every 24 hours the tide comes up, the tide goes out, the tide comes up, and the tide goes out. There is, in effect, four changes every day in, out, in, out. And we forget that, that cancer is the master of living in dynamic change, living in the most nutrient-rich place on the planet where the ocean feeds it twice a day with fresh water supply and then recedes so the sun or the air, the oxygen can do its work. The thing is that the crab, in order to survive, needs to pay attention to the changing tides because it doesn't want to be left high and dry when the next tide comes up and it doesn't want to be in so deep that it can't get to the oxygen and to the edge where the action is. So the, t so the crab is always anticipating the change and it often lives in fear of being swept away by these incredible tidal patterns so the crab becomes really good. It has this hard outer shell to protect itself from being bounced around in the tides. And it's really good at protecting itself even more by finding a harder, larger outer shell of some animal that's no longer inhabiting its shell. And it'll crawl into that shell. And then it'll drag the whole thing and wedge it under a rock or in a cave so that it can kind of be free of 
these environmental um, whimsical changes, changes of the tides. And very much so, this is analogous to the idea of our home and family and, and, and our houses. Our, our homes where we live are like our hard outer shells. The, the rhythms of the day come and go, the rhythms of life come and go, but we say blood is thicker than water, that's because the tides don't affect it in the same way. Yeah, and, and although Rick asked who had planets or the sun, moon, or ascendant in Cancer, we're all Cancers now. now who has a moon in their chart? <laughs> oh, right. That, that the idea is that astrology can teach us 12 different ways to experience ourselves. And even though we each have unique birth charts, which emphasize some of those 12 more than others, the road to enrichment and to real consciousness with astrology is to understand all the signs in you. And one of the things about cancer, cancer is associated with the moon, which has the same root as the word mood or moody. And the sign cancer, water sign, a sensitive feeling sign, and Rick described, you know, the self-protective qualities that it has. It has no backbone. <laughs> That's right. It has an exoskeleton. But what that means to us is to be aware of our moods. That is to say, most of us run through our daily lives either stoically dealing with whatever we have to deal with, or emotionally upset or exhilarated by what we don't want to deal with or what we like. And what the sign cancer really has to teach us is I think the grace of those crabs, how to be in those intertidal waters that Rick described so well, because that's cancer's real gift. Not that we're adapting so much to all the external changes, but we are more acutely aware of our internal needs and so that we can self-nourish, so that we're in touch with our own tides, not as an inexorable force which will drown us or leave us high and dry, but as part of the process of being human, in going from high to low and all the places in between. And as long as you're conscious of it and you can use that, then saying, well, I'm not in the mood to do something, may be a healthy expression of self-care. Yeah, that's a really good image, and I really especially like the idea of the crab almost as a surfer. And we're surfing not the waves on our surfboard, but we're surfing the emotional waves. And part of the biggest difference between a good surfer and an awesome surfer assuming that you can balance on the surfboard, is that an awesome surfer has a sense of which waves to ride and which waves to pass, to let pass. You don't have to ride every wave that comes along. And as you were talking, Jeff, that's the image that I had, the awareness of our changing moods. I mean, moods and moons, etymologically, is the same word, as is moon, as is menses. These are, these are all of the same root origins. And the thing about moods and moons and emotions is that they're always changing. That there is fluidity to them. It's why they are astrologically of the water element. And so the thing is, is that if we're aware of our changing moods, we then get to make the decision as to whether we're going to express it and ride it, you know, where our attention where our attention goes, that's where the energy flows. And so we can choose to be aware of a mood when we start suppressing and burying moods completely, that's when we get into trouble. But just because we're aware of a changing mood doesn't mean we need to ride it. Exactly, that, that, that's really well put, and that's the great gift that's available to all of us through about the 21st of the month. That consciousness of feeling that's not judgmental, but is alert enough, self-aware enough to go, okay, I'm angry here. Is this something I need to act upon? Because that's going to be an effective and worthwhile thing to do. Or am I just blowing off steam here? As Rick said, if we suppress or repress our emotions, well, then they're going to come up in all sorts of unhealthy and destructive and inappropriate ways. But the same is also true if we have no consciousness or filter around our emotions, if we're just wafted by every little breeze in the sky, 
then we don't have the human consciousness of awareness that takes emotion and rather than it having be a, a problem or a source of pain, it's a nourishing, worthwhile, life-giving experience. So there's about three or four different directions I want to go right now simultaneously. <laughs> but I can't. <laughs> and, but I think, I, I think I just want to mention in passing, the fact, since we're talking about cancer, yeah. is the fact that Jupiter, which takes about 12 years to go around the sun, therefore through the signs of the zodiac, Jupiter spends about one year in each sign. Jupiter is the magnifying lens of the, of the planets. Wherever it is, it, it makes things bigger and, and, and more. It, it amplifies them. It, it exp it's expansive. And for the past year, since last summer, Jupiter has been in the sign of Cancer. And so now, as the Sun is joining Jupiter in Cancer, and it actually um, is getting closer to it all month, is an interesting juxtaposition, because as the Sun is moving through Cancer, Jupiter is saying, I've been here a whole year, I gotta go. And so part of the big change of this month is that toward the end of the month, and we'll drill down on dates in just a minute, Jupiter moves from Cancer into Leo, and that becomes part of what this larger transition is, uh, is about. Uh, yeah, and I think that was really a good direction to go in because it doubles up on the Cancer story. And Cancer, on another level, has to do with memory and collected personal experiences. Rick referred to home and family before, which is part of our album of life experiences. And Jupiter, called Guru in Sanskrit or Hindi, is the planet of higher mind, indicating that, that the expansion of cancer, which can be your insecurity, which can be your emotionalism, which can also be your sentimentality about the past, Nevertheless, we've got, Jupiter leaves Cancer on the 16th of this month, so we've got another two weeks of a great learning opportunity from our emotional history. If you want to revisit your past, not to complain, not to beat yourself up, but to take it as a source of information, Jupiter, the great teacher, is saying it's through your personal experiences that you can learn the most for the next two weeks. Although, if you're going to complain, I think it's good to do it while planets are in Cancer. Oh, it's perfect. <laughs> cancer is such, <laughs> cancer's the whining sign, isn't it? Yeah. You know, there is, the, there is something about the sign of Cancer, about the moon, that is when you feel safe. Now, when one is, in, when one is secure, one can then unload its negativity well, along with it. Again, it's the, it's the flow, it's the both sides of the, of the tide. Well, also cancer associated with the moon is the mother-child relationship. Right. So it evokes something infantile in us. Now it's very interesting, if you react in an infantile, emotional way, which I do every time I'm behind the wheel of a car. Now, <laughs> and I can vouch for that. Uh, <laughs> and so can the people under the wheels of my car. But it's, it's really interesting that even if you're behaving in a way which is infantile, for you. If you're not judgmental about it, that is, if you don't push it away as bad, but if you breathe with it and hang out with it, you may begin to disconnect or break the old emotional patterns. And it's what psychotherapy is about, is where did the pattern start? Let's go back to it by having an understanding of it. We can either deepen the neuroses by giving it a name and, and a label, or we, we can begin a process of becoming more autonomous, moving out of that baby infantile state of whining and I can't do anything about it. Okay, I get it. We can feel helpless. We may, in fact, circumstantially, in some situations, be helpless, yet we are still alive and what we always have the choice of is perspective and interpretation. You can take the same tragedy and experience twice in your life. Once is just a painful, awful thing with no awareness and another time with awareness 
And awareness doesn't erase pain, but it reduces it because it blends it with meaning. It gives it a perspective. It gives a perspective right. too. Right. Yeah. 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 Suffering is reduced when you know why you're suffering at a deeper level. Because it what so much of pain is about is being cut off and tight and narrow. So if we can take a painful thing and see it in a larger context, which is what Jupiter and Cancer can do, we can be on our way to not just healing and getting over it, but getting healthier and better and growing bigger, stronger than we've ever been before. So July is a pivotal turning point in the year. One, because Jupiter, which has been in the sign of Cancer, is now moving into the sign of Leo. Two, planets have been largely retrograde since the beginning of the year, actually since December, when Venus turned retrograde. Um, then Venus turned direct and Mercury turned retrograde. And then on March 1st, give or take a day, Mercury turned retrograde, uh, Mercury Mars. turned direct, and Mars turned retrograde. And then just as Mars was, was turning direct and getting going, then Mercury turned retrograde again and did anyone notice? Yesterday, Mercury finished up its three-week retrograde period, and Mercury is now moving direct. And for the first time, we actually have a little bit of clear planetary movement in front of us with the personal planets. Those are the faster-moving inner planets of Mercury, how we think, Venus, what we like or what we're attracted to, Mars, how we go out and get it, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, as of today, are all moving direct, and they're all moving direct for a while. And this is a real change of, uh, 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 of how we relate to our own individual lives, I think. Yeah, and I think that change is rolling out slowly for several reasons. One, we're in Cancer. The sun's in Cancer. There's no need to be in a rush in Cancer. You don't just grab things and go. You palpate them with your fingers, you sniff them with your nose, you sort of engage in a more intimate and experience and complain about them, or, or you can ooh and ah if you like. And the fact that Mercury, the communication planet, back in its airy home sign of Gemini, just stopped moving backwards yesterday. And as Rick often gives the example with a retrograde, is when planets are turning from forward to a retrograde or vice versa. It's like a pendulum. There's a moment where they're standing still, and Mercury is still virtually yeah, standing still. Yeah, I mean, still. for the last day or two, and today, Mercury barely moves a half a degree, and I envision it, it's almost like, it's, it's almost like being a spinning top, but all of a sudden the camera is, it's, it's a ballet dancer who's doing turns, their heads, will often focus on one point, their body will spin, but their head keeps snapping back to that point. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like Mercury, at this time, it's like the rest of the universe is turning, <laughs> but our communication, our words, our interactions, somehow are locked, they're frozen. It still may feel frustrating, like we're not connecting or we're not getting things going as quickly as we like, but, but it really is a turning point. And I think there's even another piece on this and you, I think maybe you, we're going to go there, but now I'm there. <laughs> um, and that is that Mercury had moved into Cancer, and then when it retrograded, it moved back into, as Jeff called it, its airy home sign of Gemini. And now that Mercury is moving direct again, it's still in Gemini, and so it's still lagging behind the sun, and this month we'll have both Mercury and Venus moving into Cancer. We kind of have this wonderful juxtaposition here of looking back intellectually, mentally, into, with air signs, which are mental, and yet things pulling through, um, through Cancer, which is more emotional. Yeah, and I think we'll have a deeper level of understanding of recent events when Mercury gets back into that feeling-oriented sign Cancer, which is on, on the 13th, July 12th, um, or 13th, depending on yeah. what time zone you're in. That, that, it, it varies. But the point is this, if you ever had the experience, you have the aha experience, oh, I got it, the light bulb goes off in your head, and you have an intellectual, you have an epiphany, an awareness of something. 
And then six months or six years later, you have the same aha experience, except this time it's not an idea. It's visceral. It's gut level. You know in your body and in your feelings something that you knew as true intellectually, but now you know it emotionally. And I think that's part of the shift. Mercury going forward now, but slowly, in Gemini, you can have all the facts and the data. You can know things. You can get the conversations going that have been hung up. But it won't be, probably until Mercury enters Cancer, that you get the deeper emotional undercurrent and content. You know, Mercury and Gemini is like reading a script. There's just the words. And you don't know what the tone is of the words. You don't know what the subtext is, what the feeling content. It's like and being in a chat room. <laughs> exactly. But that's what we're moving for. Got some other planetary changes to talk about with you. But before we get to that, you know, Rick and I have been talking for three years about the ongoing series of squares between revolutionary Uranus and transformational Pluto. This is the 60s part too, because Uranus and Pluto were joined together in the mid-1960s and represented or symbolized the social and cultural changes of that tumultuous period of time. Uranus has now moved out to a right angle square with Pluto that's continuing on and off into next year. And we get a couple of hits on that coming up in the next few days. We, we do, and this is really interesting because many of you probably heard about the now infamous grand cross or grand cardinal square back around April 20th on the exact date when Uranus was square Pluto and they and Pluto was exactly opposed by by Jupiter which has now moved on and exactly square and opposed by Mars which was retrograde then so we had planets in each of the four cardinal signs, Uranus and Aries, at that time Jupiter and Cancer, Mars in Libra, and Pluto in Capricorn, each 90 degrees or one, 90 degrees, 180 degrees um, uh, to each other. So there were four points on a grand square. Well, now Mars is direct and moving on again. Over the last week, it contacted both Pluto and Uranus. But now we have the sun moving through Cancer, again coming into the picture, and through later in the month and early, um, early in August, we have both Mercury this month and then Venus doing the same thing. So we're not quite done with it, but what's really interesting, and I think this is where you're going, is toward the full moon? Not or yet. Not, not yet. I didn't not. say that. <laughs> Scratch that. It's all right. Well, this is what happens said, when we rehearse these. So no, no, we had we had a shorter rehearsal this week. But the 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 grand square that we had in April did not involve the sun, and the sun represents will as well as consciousness. So on the fourth of July, the sun comes into an exact opposition to Pluto, a planet of purging, a planet of death and rebirth, a planet of transformation, and then on the eighth the sun forms a square or a challenging right angle to revolutionary Uranus. Now, at a lower level of energy, this can just mean dramatic power struggles and explosions and all of the instability that a Uranus-Pluto square represents. However, if we're operating as healthy suns in Cancer, which is creating that solar conscious that's solar, and caring, that's cancer, then we have an opportunity to engage the process of change as willful initiators rather than innocent bystanders. So everything depends upon your state of consciousness. If you've got something, someone, some attitude, some habit, some pattern you want to get rid of, the 4th of July with the Sun-Pluto opposition is, a, is an appropriate time, give or take a couple of days, to do that. And is certainly a more desirable expression of a Sun-Pluto opposition than getting hunkered down in a power struggle, in resentment to somebody. The point being that changing ourselves is the place of empowerment. Trying to change other people is a pretty 
permanent place of frustration for most of us. And that's the kind of story that we may be getting more of this weekend and into next week. It's important to look at the dynamic changes this week and next week with the sun um, opposing Pluto and squaring Uranus, not in isolation, not as separate events, but it's really healthy to look back and even take out your day timer, does anyone use day timers anymore? Your outlook, whatever it is, and, and, and look and see what was going on for you back in mid-April, you know, the second half of April when this square was really humming. What were the issues? What were you trying to break out of? Where were you feeling that resentment and anger and the pressure from someone else, the sun now the sun opposed Pluto, then it was Jupiter opposed Pluto? Because this is in a larger context of issues and events that really go back to, heck, back to the spring of 2010, 11, 12, 13. Now we're in this process again. Things get heated up as the sun makes these aspects. However, there's an important I think a very, very significant piece that's happening now that wasn't happening then. And that is that Saturn, which has been moving through um, Scorpio, is in the picture in a couple of very important ways. Saturn is the planet of restraint and boundary. Uranus is the planet that has to do with blowing up the boundaries and breaking through the, the restraints. Uranus is, the, um, is lightning, it's shock and surprise. Well, through 2012 and 2013, Uranus and Saturn were on and off in this quincunx aspect. A quincunx is five twelves, and I actually learned this week, I always thought it was quincunx, but it's actually quinc unx, because unx is Latin for, for 12. Hmm. Quink unx. Five. Who would have known? Okay. Five. Well, yeah. Anyhow, um, so Saturn and Uranus being in this dance of, of inconvenience, of, of, of um, irritation is a good word that's used to describe the quink unx. And, and this month, Uranus and Saturn, Saturn and Uranus, are back in this aspect, but they don't quite reach it exactly because Saturn is going backwards. Saturn's retrograding now. It turns direct this month. Uranus is moving direct, but it turns retrograde this month. And these two planets all month are kind of annoying each other, which means that we may be hard pressed to resolve those areas in our life where we need to respect that boundaries versus where we need to blow through them. And into this mix comes the sun squaring Uranus, blow it up, but at the same time trining Saturn saying, yes, but what you do or don't do now has way more staying power, longevity, endurance, and persistence than perhaps you realize. Yeah, and there's a helpful part of this, perhaps, and that's that Saturn, which is normally about preservation or containment, is in Scorpio. So demolition is appropriate. It's just a controlled demolition. That is, and it's like, it's almost like being an actuary, you know, the people who figure out the odds for insurance companies. That's Saturn and Scorpio. All right, I'd like to quit my job. What would it cost me? I'd like to change my hair cut. How's that going to affect things? There's a calculation here. The sun trying Saturn is a conscious calculation of something, sun square Uranus, which could be liberating, shocking, or breaking free. But I think this is a very favorable pattern in the sense that we've been dealing so long with the instability of Uranus in, in Aries square Pluto, that here at least it seems like even if bombs are going off across the street, that we still have a barrier, a protective yeah, boundary in which to uh, observe, safely observe the changes. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. And it's even made more complicated by the fact that Venus is also in the picture forming a supportive sextile saying, I like the change. Venus, what we like. Uranus, the sudden and dramatic change of routine. But she, Venus, 
is also forming a quincunx with Saturn. And actually, the moon is in the picture there also on July 7th. I think this is a very powerful day. I mean, this whole week, July 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, is powerful. But I think that there's a part of us that really wants change. We're really into it. We're going to do what we do to make it, you know, to make it happen. It's going to be good for us. And yet, we're also unsettled by it. That Venus quincunx to the um, to to the Saturn is like I don't know quite how much to push the edge here. Yeah, and, and I think that idea changes often. Uh, uh, a scary proposition but I think part of the larger patterns that's you're in a square Pluto and the culture and the environment in which we're living suggests to me as I've said here many times that it's safer to change than it is to stand still agree I mean generally that's true because life is a mobile activity much as it doesn't feel like it at times and while Rick said yeah, there's some tension building up with the Sun-Pluto opposition on the 4th, although we can say it's an opportunity for change. We have a full moon on the 12th, which really may be the culminating point or the peak point for this conversation, this decision point that we each have about standing still or changing and if we are going to change, which I certainly would recommend, uh, how are we going to do it? Because what's happening on July 12th this year is that we have the full moon. Now the full moon is always a point of tension because the sun of consciousness and the moon of emotion are in opposite signs. So we're trying to encompass opposite principles. We've talked about the sun and sensitive cancer, and here's the moon, normally a sensitive planet at the full moon, which is in hard-nosed Capricorn. I mean, kind of the, the cancer way of being is, ouch, that hurts, let me pull back and find something comfortable. And the Capricorn way is, ouch, that hurts, get over it, you wimp. Just toughen up and push on through. So that's just part of the conversation of this particular full moon that we're having on the 12th. Yeah, and I think also another piece of this full moon is that it is one more replay of the grand square. Because even though the full moon is at a little bit later degrees, the Pluto is at 12, Uranus is at 16, the full moon is at 19 and 20 degrees, um, it's at 20 degrees um, of, of Cancer. It, it still pulls in the Mars, and so once again, we have these four points, the four cardinal points that says change, change, change. It's about initiating change, not waiting for it to happen. And also recognizing, because I think one of the issues of the Capricorn moon, those born with Capricorn moons usually grew up early because they weren't baby for better or for worse. Or brought up by grandparents. I've noticed a lot of Capricorn moon people I, I met having parents that are either very much older or being brought up by their grandparents. Because it means that that baby quality of the moon sort of jumped to an older, more responsible, constrained uh, uh, level in Capricorn. But what we have here, too, the north node of the moon, which is a point of growth or integration, is joined by active Mars, both in associative Libra, the relationship sign, and Venus, the planet of love and pleasure, is trying or harmonized to Mars, which means change, great, I'm for it. But you don't have to do it all by yourself. Right. There are allies out there, whether they come in the form of other people, the most common form, or of other ideas. See, there's a tendency with the moon in Capricorn to say, well, I wasn't babied as a kid, so I just got to deal with this myself. There's an isolated side when that mountain goat gets to the top of the mountain, is the head goat. But this is reminding us that even though the illusion is that we're alone, there are assets and allies all over the place. Yeah, or as Tom Robbins would say, it's never too late to have a happy childhood. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, something that we just kind of slipped over and I just want to bring into the discussion because again, it makes for such a unique month. And that is, we talked about the sun's trying to Saturn 
while you know while it was also opposing Pluto and, and or while it was also uh, during the full moon, it was the sun the sun trining Saturn. But through the week of July seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, not only do we have the sun. I'll come back this up in a couple of days. Not only do we have the sun uh, trining Saturn. But we also have Saturn um, and the Sun both mutually trining Chiron. And we often gloss over Chiron, um, although it certainly is an important body up there. It's uh, one of the larger non-standard planets. Chiron is the wounded healer. And Chiron in this grand trine with Saturn and the Sun, I think also have to do with this associative, even, even though it's, you were talking about the um, Mars um, joining up with the node and the trine from Venus and how that has to do with support from people. And I think that this background here of this watery grand trine with Chiron has to do with, with vulnerability and with forgiveness with not only forgiving other people, but forgiving our own shortcomings and, and, and being aware of our vulnerability so that we can be open to this wonderful potential. Yeah, I think you're right, Rick. A grand trine is the most harmonious relationship between three planets or three bodies to have in sensitive water signs, and particularly involving intense Saturn and Scorpio. I think Rick is right. There's the, the possibility of forgiving others and forgiving ourselves. That you can go to the deepest, darkest places of fixation that you have. And if you have the right company, there's an opportunity that with a cup of tea, a glass of wine, the right poem, the right perfume, whatever, that that energy starts to move and we come out of that sort of wounded place of emotional isolation. Now, just we gotta pick up the pace a little bit, Mercury, I mentioned went back into Cancer on the 13th of July and then on the 16th Jupiter goes into Leo and we talked about Jupiter going into Leo uh, indicating a year in which growth and expansion has more to do with what we're creating in the future than what we've done in the past. Water, Cancer, has to do with the past. Fire has to do with creation. Leo fire. Right. Leo, where Jupiter is, is entering, has to do with a year in which I, it's appropriate, I think, to take creative risks and to be bolder in doing that. And, and, we'll, and we'll be talking more about that Jupiter and Leo throughout the year as it makes aspects and other planets make aspect to it. But this is setting up the second half of the year now as Jupiter moves into Leo and then over the next few days um, we have um, actually the Sun having moved into the Sun moves into Leo doo -doo -doo -doo, on the 22nd which begins the um, the month of Leo we shift from the watery nurturing sensitive um, uh, belly up by the beach. The sun's yeah, entry into Leo summer. marks the middle of summer. Leo is pride, will, creativity, the power of the individual, of ego. But four days, is it on the 24th of July, the sun joins Jupiter in Leo. That only happens one day every 12 years. And this is a, it, it, it's, it's a time that's ripe for runaway ego. Especially in Leo. As well, because it's Leo, but there are positive sides of that. While we can be blinded to, real to an objective reality by our egos, our egos can also be sources of generation, generating power and will and expression and consciousness and creativity. And a Sun-Jupiter conjunction in Leo is certainly an opportunity for all of us to either really do or fantasize about being gods and goddesses of a world that we're creating. And you know, maybe you can't create everything in your world. Of course, none of us can. But a little bit more of that empowers you, which makes us all a bit more solar and creative and powerful. Well, I've, I've heard you say many times about Leo in general, and I think magnified by the, by, I mean, Jupiter and the Sun together are like 99 point something percent of the mass of the entire solar system. And 
when Jupiter, and I've heard you say about Leo, it's like when Leo, when Leo is secure in its own being, it is fully magnanimous and generous. I mean, this is the sun that is lighting up everything on the planet without wanting anything back. Okay, it wants a little worship from, you know, cultures here and there, but, um, but the fact is that it gives of its warmth and its light and is not depleted just because I'm looking at something in the daylight doesn't take away from someone else seeing something from its light. So there is this unlimited ability to be generous and magnanimous and yet, when it's insecure, when it's needy, then it says, look at me, look at me, look how clever I am, look at what I'm doing, I need your attention, because when I don't have your attention, I am nothing. That's the flip side of Leo, and we just need, just need to pay attention, because we both, we, we go through both aspects of this at different times in our lives. Yeah, it's like the difference between bravado and bravery. Bravery is the real courage of engagement. Bravado is the bullshit show of it. That's, it's, it's the act, and that's a shadow side of Leo. And of course, Le Leo is also, it's about the act. It's about the performance. And you know, there is something to, with these planets in Leo, there's something to that old saying is like, you know, fake it until you make it. There's something about going through the motions of being generous. Doesn't mean not to have your heart in it, but if you can at least go through the motions, then you get to feel what it might feel like if you were that way all the time. Right. Now, so we have a lot of power coming up with the sun joining Jupiter in Leo, and yet the deliverer of energy is the planet Mars, which has been sort of a bit effete since entering Libra about eight and a half months ago. Yeah, back in October. October. Yeah, last fall, Mars, the planet of assertion, aggression, immediacy, spontaneous young energy has been in Libra, which is like, is it okay for me to be spontaneous now? Can, is it okay for me to be independent or to act on my own? I mean, traditional astrology considered Mars to be weaker in Libra. What it's really about is just having to filter impulse through a more socialized perspective of reality but Mars gets its testosterone back, and then some, on the 25th of July. And this is, this is available, it's like sunshine, available regardless of your plumbing. <laughs> Mars enters Scorpio, one of its traditional home signs. And what that suggests, where Mars in Libra tends to equivocate, or is concerned with how things look, Mars in Scorpio doesn't give a crap about that. That doesn't mean we're all just going to become animals, but what it does mean is collectively that we will have a greater opportunity to find the emotional intensity, the passion, the commitment to get done whatever it is we want to get done. It means that if you've been playing a game of chess, when Mars moves into Scorpio, you stand up, you flip the chessboard over, and you take out your sword, and you go, let's settle this one, you know, like, like, like real warriors. Mars, you know, we forget, we moderners forget because, because we're, 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 we're trained to thinking of Pluto as being the planet of Scorpio, that Mars in ancient astrology was not only the feisty, fiery, energetic um, warrior planet of, of Aries, but it was also the passionate, emotional, watery fighter of Scorpio. And so Mars is now, when I say now, on the 25th yeah. um, of July, Mars moves back into his other home sign, but not the sign of action, the sign of passion, which may have action, but there's more about, about the uh, rather than the ha! There's two different energetic motions here, and, and, and yet Mars is certainly uh, at home and is thankful that the chess game is over. Yeah, I think a big difference too between Mars and Aries and Mars and Scorpio 
is there's no accidental pregnancies with Mars and Scorpio. You know what you're inseminating. With Mars and Aries, you're just shooting stuff off, and you have, you, you're totally disconnected from the act of your own actions. Mars and Scorpio is much more committed to follow through and affect an impact of its actions. If Mars and Aries did battle with Mars and Scorpio, if Mars and Aries didn't win the on first the thing. first blow, Mars and Scorpio would always win right. because it has that staying power, that intensity, the deeper commitment and understanding of what the whole picture is rather than just the wonderful when it's in motion impulse of Mars and Aries in that moment. Right, so what we're getting is all of this power in the, in the latter part of the month. Leo doesn't measure costs. It's fire, it just does it. Scorpio does measure cost, but Scorpio and Leo are both fixed signs and they're both very powerful. So this is a very important transition and we get another look at it with the new moon on the 26th of the month, which is the day of the most famous people. Just go look up who was born on July 26th. Come on, give us a partial what list. What do you mean from Mick, Mick Jagger. Jagger and Carl Jung and George Bernard Shaw and there's a whole the whole slew of them. But this year, the new moon on the 26th of July is conjunct or pretty darn close to Jupiter. A new moon is the beginning of a new monthly cycle every month. This is a monthly cycle of Leo, of will, of creativity, of joyous expression and warmth and, and generosity in a healthy way. And it's joined with gigantic Jupiter, which says, go for it. To a certain extent, we talked earlier about change quite a bit and about risk. It's important to take risks. Now, I'm not suggesting that you risk your life, but I am suggesting that with this or mine, <laughs> or risks, mine, feel free to do whatever you want. But this new moon on the 26th is one of the most creative new moons we can have, it's in Leo, but with Jupiter there, what it may mean is, and what could scare some of us is, the expansiveness of our imaginations, our wills, our ego, our creativity can seem over the top. And yet, I think it is appropriate to go a little bit too far. You can always pull it back in if your plan is, is too big, if your love is too big. But I think opening up your heart and loving and loving yourself and, and loving the creative potential of life is strongly enriched by this particular new moon. Yeah, I, I agree with you fully and I think also we need to pay a little bit of attention to Venus because Venus just a couple days prior had exactly opposed Pluto and then in a couple days hence it squares Uranus the opposition to Pluto is on the 27th and the square to Uranus is on the 31st. And this again, it, it's like another round of that dance of the, of, the, of the cardinal squares. There's nothing now in Libra, which is interesting because that part has moved on, but we still once again, uh, we're getting another shot at something, but things are changed. By the end of this month, things are substantially different. We're no longer in the same realm that we've been in for the last six months or a year or so, I think. Absolutely. The, the one thing that you bring up uh, about Venus, the planet of love, self-worth, and validation in Cancer, now she's kind of shy and she's kind of insecure. So to have the planet of validation feeling hypersensitive and insecure, at a period of time in which you're about to pick the winning lottery ticket means don't let your insecurity, you may, you may overestimate your insecurity or your lack of value and, if, and still go forward. I encourage you to go forward because the bigger issues are involving the sun, the moon, and Jupiter. Right.